Good morning, church. I want to once again thank everyone from ICC who served last week for our Community Fund Day. You know, we blew past our expected numbers and also our budget, but it was truly a brilliant introduction to the community. And you know, for a small group of men and women, we were once again reminded of the goodness of God, not only evidenced by the turnout, but we believe by the specific people who turned up and we were able to connect with. You know, God continues to work by drawing men and women, according to John 6, 44. And so we steadfastly pray for his transformative work to be done here in Kalanga. He has given us a reason to praise. Now, we had a sermon towards the end of 2022 on praise and the prescriptive pattern we see throughout scripture. I think Hebrews 13, 15 is a constant reminder for us. Through him, then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, praising his name. We see that true praise is not born of man's carnal efforts. Rather, we are enabled by Christ to continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Continually speaks to a regular occurrence, a lifestyle behaviour, whereas a sacrifice of praise speaks of cost. We aren't told to offer up a performative-based praise where the fruit of our lips choose to praise his name if things are going well for us or when we believe we are seeing tangible evidence of what we deem his goodness is in our current circumstance. Rather, in humility, let us remember that in every season of life and in every moment and emotion, he is worthy. Psalm 145 verse 3 tells us, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Church, it makes sense that unsearchable greatness would garner continual sacrificial praise. I often say to myself, as a reminder of said greatness, that if God were never to do another thing for me, he would still be worthy of my praise. Which is a bit silly as far as things to pronounce anywhere when you think about it, as if this should ever be a question for someone redeemed by the Lamb. That was enough for an eternity of praise, what God sent his Son to do and what his Son accomplished for us on the cross. That's worth all the praise for eternity. 1 Chronicles 29.11 says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth. Yours is the dominion, Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. In his greatness and majesty alone, he is worthy of the fruit of our lips praising his name, church. But he has given us reasons to praise him this morning. Of the endless reasons, I want to encourage us with seven this morning. Okay, so firstly, we praise him because he knows us. Psalm 139, 1-6 O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. This is an incredible psalm penned by King David. Immediately in the first line, David's words spoken of God directly oppose the pervading view many other nations had of their own deities or lowercase gods. These gods were usually unknowable, indifferent to the day-to-day happenings of man, detached and even hostile. But here David reminds us that the Lord searches and knows us. What a thing it is to be known by the same God who created the universe. It's not an impersonal omniscience, but rather, in knowing everything, he also knows you and I. As we sit down and rise up, in the mundane, everyday, seemingly inconsequential actions, there is nothing that escapes his notice. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. So many people have issues with their communication, not only expressing their thoughts and emotions in a cohesive, understandable and appropriate way, but often people may struggle to articulate and identify the emotions they are experiencing in that moment too. 
If you don't believe me, look at the millions of books written on communication. As humans, we long to know and be known. And so what an incredible thing it is to have an all-powerful God who knows the intricacies of every single thought, emotion, and the very words that will come from our mouths and desires to commune with us anyway. Often vulnerability garners negative emotions because some people believe that if others were to know them beyond the superficial, they might think less of them, they might despise them, or they might even want to break relationship with them. You know, we're, we're so afraid of people seeing the real us, you know, flaws and all. And yet the creator of the universe knows you and I in our entirety. And he loves us enough to send his son for us so that we could be reconciled to him. Isaiah 43 verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says. He who is your creator, Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. He formed us. He knows us. He has redeemed us. He has called us by name and we are his. And because of this, we praise him. We praise him because he rejoices over us. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. This is a beautiful verse that we read here. Zephaniah was a descendant of King Hezekiah and prophesied during the reign of King Josiah. In the first portion of this chapter, we read about God's judgment for those who fail to trust and obey him, those who live in idolatry. But in the beautiful turn at around verse 14, we read of how those who place their trust in God, he will save them. We are told that he is in our midst, once again speaking of his presence with us, and then he is described as a victorious warrior. He rejoices over us with joy. I think it's easy to forget the love that God has for his people and the joy he finds in us. Let us not believe that we live in a state where God is constantly irritated or annoyed with us. Imperfect and faulty as the church may be, even when we mourn, we don't mourn as those without any hope because we have a God who knows us and rejoices over us with joy. We are told that God rejoices over us with singing. You know, what a thought. I mean, we are comfortable with the idea of us singing his praise, but how often do we consider that he rejoices over us with singing? The Hebrew word is rinna, which translates to a ringing cry, a loud cry of joyful praise. Not a softly spoken word, but a joyful shout over his people. Like the bridegroom rejoicing over his bride, spoken of in Isaiah 62 verse 5, such is the love that God has for us, that he would rejoice over us. Spurgeon said this, Think of the great Jehovah singing. Can you imagine it? Is it possible to conceive of the deity breaking into a song? Father, Son and Holy Ghost together singing over the redeemed. God is so happy in the love which he bears for his people best to his people, that he breaks the eternal silence, and sun and moon and stars with astonishment hear God chanting a hymn of joy. He sings over us, the redeemed, his children with shouts of joyful acclamation, and this, church, is reason to praise him. Church, we praise him because he upholds us. Isaiah 41 verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, what an incredible comfort, church. In a world broken by sin, filled with fear and uncertainty, our Creator commands us, fear not. Not an intellectually dishonest act, purely the result of positive thinking or positive vibes. Rather, He commands us to fear not because He is with us. Look throughout scripture and over and over again you will see God commanding us to fear not. And each time the same reason is given for not fearing. Numerous occasions throughout scripture, his promised and enduring presence. One of the beautiful things about this passage is the fact that God speaks to us here in the first person. I am with you. This is why we can take him at his word when he promises to strengthen us and help us and uphold us. 
Have you ever had to face or walk through something and the people that you thought you could lean on respond to you with something like, you know, oh, well, we'll be with you in spirit, which is often Christianese for, I ain't going to be there. We don't serve a God who just sends his well wishes or thoughts and prayers, but rather God dwells within us. We have his spirit, not just I'll be with you in spirit in a Christianese sense, but he has given us his spirit and he promises to never leave nor forsake us. I think of the picture of Aaron and her upholding Moses' hands in Exodus 17, and it's a beautiful one. You know, Moses was the, at the end of his strength, and he was up, uh, upheld and sustained through the strength of men God used. But church, in God, we have something even better. Not just someone who sustains and upholds us in every season, but we have our very source of strength. God says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Whilst there's significance in the right hand in scripture, let us note how God describes his hand as righteous. God's righteousness is his unwavering commitment to act for his glory. He never diverts or alters from that course. So whatever we face in life, no matter what the season, when we are seeking to walk with him, we know that naturally as his children, his name is at stake. We can trust that for his name's sake and his love for us, he will act with zeal upholding us with his righteous right hand. Spurgeon said this, There is neither in heaven, nor earth, nor hell, anything we need fear when we are once right with God. Settle the centre and the circumference is secure. When we are right with God, we have the promise of his upholding and that is a reason to praise him this morning. We praise him this morning because he cares about us. 1 Peter 5, 6-7 Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you. Many people in this world would identify as theists, you know, and with that, these same people deny that man is able to know God in a personal and meaningful way. But here we are told that as we humble ourselves before God, the almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, we're able to cast, to literally throw, like a net being cast, all of our anxiety in its entirety onto him. Why? Because he cares for us. A God who not only cares for us personally, but demonstrates this so pragmatically in that he would say, hey, cast everything that makes you anxious, everything that keeps you up at night, everything that stresses you and attempts to grip your heart. Cast it all onto me because I care about you. Psalm 55 verse 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Another example of us being told to cast our burdens upon the Lord. But there's even more to this. That word burden in the Hebrew is the word yahor. It doesn't just speak to anxiety, a burden or a load, but it actually speaks to what is given to us. In other words, God doesn't just tell us to cast our anxiety onto him. Rather, everything that we are given as part of the burden of life, we are told to cast onto him. In every season, the good or the bad, the easy or the tough, he promises to sustain us and promises that he will never allow the righteous to be shaken. The key for us as believers is to learn to cast every day, to live under the mighty hand of God, allowing him to be our sustainer, in every moment, with him as our first and only source of strength. When we learn to rely on him in the good times, we don't have to try and learn how to rely on him suddenly when things are bad. Only a God who truly cares would tell us to cast all of what we are given in this life onto him and promise to sustain us and never let us be shaken. And this church is a reason to praise him. Church, we praise him because he watches over us. Genesis 28, 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. God's promise to Jacob in his dream at Bethel. A promise to him then, but a promise I believe that endures for us even now. Once again, God speaks of his presence with his people and then promises that wherever we go, he will keep us. 
That word is shamar, to watch over, to preserve. Wherever we go in life, as we walk in the Spirit, He promises that He will watch over us and preserve us no matter where we may go. In Psalm 139 verse 7, David asked the question, Where can I go from your Spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? He asked this not because he was seeking to flee from God, but rather as a way of exclaiming, Wherever I find myself, you are present there. Wherever I go, you see me and you are aware of me. Psalm 121 verse 4, Behold, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Again, a promise to the people of God. He who watches over Israel, he who keeps Israel, he who preserves Israel will neither slumber or sleep. Have you ever meant to be watching something or someone and then taking your eyes off the situation or the person for a brief moment and something has gone wrong? Even if it was only for a moment, I think parents will relate to that. What a blessing we have in the Good Shepherd whose eyes are always on his sheep. Not as a distant watchman or as an astronomer silently observing distant happenings through a, a telescope. That's not the picture we have. Rather, a vigilant and present observer who promises to preserve us wherever we go. Psalm 121 verse 8, The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. What is interesting is that Psalm 121, where the two previous verses have actually come from, Psalm 121 is one of the songs of ascent psalms. Scholars believe that David was the author and that you know maybe he penned this during his strife with Absalom. What we do know is that this was a song sung by travellers, specifically Jewish men and women, as they would travel to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. This was a reality for them. They believed as they travelled and journeyed that the Lord watched over them in an all-encompassing way, in their coming and their going. What a comfort to know that our God watches over us and promises to preserve us. What a reason to praise, church. We praise him because he guides us. Proverbs 16.9 The mind of a person plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. A very familiar verse to us. Now, don't get this wrong. This is certainly not a verse that would somehow promote haphazard decisions or a lack of planning or poor stewardship on the basis of some sort of a quesera sera type theology. In Ephesians alone, we are told this, you know, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called, Ephesians 4.1. Not to walk as an unbeliever, you know, in the futility of their minds, Ephesians 4.17. To walk in love, Ephesians 5.2. To walk as children of the light, Ephesians 5.8. To walk in wisdom, Ephesians 5.15. And in Galatians, you'll all be familiar with chapter 5 verse 16, you know, instructions to live by the Spirit. So, as believers, as we seek to walk according to what Scripture says, and we make plans in our hearts, we can have complete confidence that God, in His goodness and sovereignty, will direct our steps. This is one of the most freeing things for the believer. To know that as we humbly walk with God, he is directing us. He is not a God taken by surprise. He is not a God who remains a passive observer, powerless to guide us or order our steps, but rather he is always at work. And it gets better. In Romans 8, after speaking to the persecution and trials facing the early church, we find this all too familiar verse. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 What confidence we have, church, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So he directs his children's paths. And more than just moving us like chess pieces, he directs our paths for his good. You know, how often do we cry out to God, confused as to why we're going through a specific season or why we find ourselves in a specific place? Only to look back down the track and realize that whilst everything didn't go according to the plans we made in our own heart, the Lord was clearly directing us, growing us, preparing us and orchestrating our lives so that his will, not our will, his will could be done. Psalm 32 verse 8 I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. 
he guides us not as a strategist, you know, a distant general, but as a loving father who promises us that he will work things together for our good. And that is a reason to praise him. And finally, church, we praise him because he never leaves us. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not be fearful. Do not be dismayed. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to follow all that I commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. His presence is constant. He will never leave us. And he will never forsake us. And because he will never leave us, we don't ever have to fear or be dismayed. That word dismayed, literally to crack or to be broken. Because he never leaves us, I can live in confidence and I can live whole, free of fear. For his presence is everything. And that church is a reason to praise. Why don't we praise him together this morning? All of the glory and the honour is due his name.